Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming to the All Candidates Meeting, the Provincial Candidates Meeting for 2022. <laughs> has been organizing all candidates meetings, federal, provincial, and municipal, for many years. The Chamber is the voice of your business community, which generates many of the jobs that put bread on our tables. The Chamber recognizes the important contributions of each level of government to our economic health and well-being. We have a very active advocacy committee, which monitors local economic indicators and lobbies all levels of government on issues that affect business. The Chamber believes that one of the most important ballots you will ever cast is the provincial election on June 2nd. In our democracy, each elector has a responsibility to exercise their franchise. We want to do that on a fully informed, carefully considered basis. That's our purpose tonight, to get to know the candidates better and to hear them articulate their performance, their platforms, sorry. I am pleased to introduce our moderator, this evening, it's J.C. Coots from Bayshore Broadcasting. J.C. will quickly, quickly review the format of the meeting and the rules of engagement. J.C. Thank you, Diane, and thank you, Gary Byers. Uh, so, our format tonight, uh, we are going to start with predetermined questions for the first hour tonight. These questions have been predetermined by the Advoc Advocacy Committee. Uh, the candidates will introduce themselves, they'll have two minutes to introduce themselves, 90 seconds to answer each question, 60 seconds for rebuttals, and two minutes at the end for closing statements. Uh, for your questions, uh, those in the audience that are here tonight, first of all, thank you for joining us. It is great to see so many people out to get information on the upcoming election it's just great to see people is one thing too so thanks for being here tonight it's great to see everyone if you do have a question you would like to ask we do have helpers walking around with pens and paper uh, you can give them your question or you can grab a pen and paper write it down give it back to them and they'll make their way up to the podium we'll try to get as many audience questions in tonight as we can starting at nine o'clock uh, otherwise I believe that is all the rules everything that we need to know here tonight all of our candidates are up here on the stage there are a few that could not join us tonight, so we would uh, just like to point them out. Uh, not attending tonight, uh, Remy Kaikinen, he's an independent candidate. Also not here tonight is Joel Lougheed. Uh, he is a representative of the Direct Democracy Party. And Vince Grimaldi, who is with the New Blue Party of Ontario. Uh, those three candidates were not able to attend tonight. Uh, they should all have websites, social media feeds, so you'll be able to find out information on them. And of course, elections.on.ca is your website where you can find all the provincial information, who's running, where to vote, when to vote. It's June 2nd, that's an easy one. But advanced poll information will be all there. So what we're going to do right now is meet our candidates. Now all the candidates tonight drew a number, so we are going to go in order of the number that they drew in order to meet them. The first candidate uh, that drew number one is Suzanne Coles of the Ontario Party. So Suzanne, you have two minutes to introduce yourself. Thank you very much. I'm Suzanne Coles. I am a mother and a grandmother of six grandchildren. Um, I live in Gray County, just outside of Chesley. I have a varied background in careers, both as a social worker with high-risk teenage girls in Toronto in, in nursing, and for the last 12 years I've been practicing law both as defense and as a prosecutor, most recently as the provincial offenses prosecutor for Gray and Bruce counties. I've entered into the political field because it's my belief that I have a duty to serve and I want to affect change not only for the communities but for the counties of Bruce and Gray and for the province of Ontario. We've seen far too many times with the political parties that we're seeing corruption and we're seeing broken promises and I want to affect change and bring forward an Ontario that everybody can be proud of. We have an extensive platform and I'm hoping to be able to share that with you throughout the evening tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Suzanne Coles of the Ontario Party. Uh, next we will go to the person that drew number two and that was Rick Byers of the Ontario PC Party. Thank you and good evening ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to tonight's debate and thank you to the Chamber for organizing this great event. 
My name is Rick Byers, and I'm the PC candidate for this election. I live near Markdale with my dear wife, Margo, and in September, we'll have been married 36 years. We have three sons in their 20s and 30s who are in various places. By way of background, I've been actively involved in the Grey Highlands community. I've been the treasurer of the Royal Canadian Legion, Branch 333 in Flesherton. I've been on the board of the Southeast Grey Community Health Centre, which is a great primary care clinic that has services offered in Markdale, Dundalk and Chatsworth. I was a member of the multi-municipality uh, task force that helped save Grey Gables from being sold. And for the past two years, I've been on the monthly 560 CFOS roundtable. So why am I running in this election? The answer is straightforward. I want to get stuff done for our community. And I want to follow, follow Bill Walker's great example in doing that. Whether it's schools, long-term care, daycares, our new hospital in Markdale, or broadband. These are great investments for our community. I want to continue that trend, get it done for Gray Bruce. That's why I'm running, and I look forward to your questions this evening. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Rick Byers, Ontario PC Party. Uh, next up is the candidate that drew number three, and that is Joseph Westover of the Populist Party of Ontario. Joseph? Hi, I'm uh, Joseph Westover. Uh, I was born and raised in Own Sound. Um, been kind of a freedom fighter for quite a while, and as I grew up, I didn't vote at all because I could see the corruption way back even before I was 18. Um, I haven't seen one party do what they say, and I certainly haven't seen any party perform their duty as far as limiting, limiting themselves to the spiritual and moral values of the Canadian system that we've had based on the Bill of Rights um, and our foundation. They've made laws that contradict it continually, and we don't have anybody to step up and stop it. Our um, judges aren't doing it. Our lawyers aren't doing it for us. And uh, so this party is about um, a bunch of citizens who aren't really just anybody. They're just nobodies. I'm an entrepreneur. I have my own business as a general contractor. Um, others are nurses or whatever, right? They, they're just all, all over the spectrum. And what we're doing is we're trying to take our country back and bring it back to something sound and decent that we can raise families in under uh, the Canadian Bill of Rights preamble concept. So uh, that's what I'm about. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Joseph Westover, Populist Party of Ontario. Uh, next up is the number four candidate who drew number four, and that is Selwyn Hicks of the Liberal Party. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank the Owen Sound Chamber of Commerce for organizing tonight's uh, debate. I'm Selwyn Hicks, your Liberal candidate. I'm a lawyer from Hanover, where my wife, who's here tonight, Barbara, and I, uh, own and operate a small law practice. We've been married 25 years and we have four children. I was first elected in 2006 and have been serving since that time as a councillor and deputy mayor. I also served two terms <clears throat> as a county councillor and I'm currently on leave while serving my third term as the warden for the county of Grey. I'm running in this election to restore hope and dignity for people in Bruce Gray, Owen Sound who are struggling. I want to restore dignity for the poor who spend 70 or 80% of their income on housing alone and are currently worried about how they're going to make ends meet. I want to restore dignity for small business owners struggling to keep their businesses afloat. I want to restore dignity for seniors who are saying out loud and clear that they want to stay home comfortably for as long as possible. I want to restore dignity for individuals struggling with mental health and addictions. I want to restore dignity for our indigenous brothers and sisters who have a much lower standard of living than the rest of us and are struggling with intergenerational trauma brought on by racial discrimination and genocidal injustice. To those people I say, don't lose hope. Change is on its way. You'll have a brother on the inside. You keep fighting the good fight and an MPP Hicks 
will have your back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Selwyn Hicks, Liberal Party. Uh, next up, the person that drew number five, that would be Karen Gaventer of the NDP. Thank you. I would like to start by recognizing that we are on the traditional territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. I am grateful for their continued stewardship. There are three main issues I have heard concerns about at the doorstep. Inequality and affordability, health care, and the climate emergency. The decisions of the Conservative government have not helped the people of Ontario with these issues. Prices have been skyrocketing, our health care system is broken, and Doug Ford's policies have been driving up greenhouse gas emissions. We can make things more affordable. An NDP government would regulate gas prices, which would also help curb increasing food prices. We will make it easy and affordable for people to buy, charge, and ride electric vehicles, which addresses a portion of the climate emergency and also gets around rising gas prices. The government can make policy decisions so there are more homes people can afford. We will invest in our health care system and make sure that we have a strong public system. The NDP will launch a campaign to recruit and retain health care practitioners, including more doctors. We will tackle the wait list for surgeries and procedures so people can stop waiting and start healing. The NDP has an extensive document on resolving the climate emergency. We will reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero as fast as we reasonably can. We will put in a new and fair cap and trade system. We will plant one billion trees. Not only that, the climate has, considered, has been considered throughout the NDP platform. It's not just an afterthought. You can do better if you have a government that is on your side. And that government is the NDP. On June 2nd, vote for me, Karen Gaventer. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And we will go to our final candidate, Danielle Valiquette of the Green Party. Thank you. I would like to thank the Owen Sound Chamber of Commerce for organizing today's event, as well as all the candidates that are here today. My name is Danielle Valiquette. I'm a municipal councillor, a farmer, and a mother. As a municipal councillor, I quickly discovered that municipalities receive more tax money for building too far up and too far out, leaving farmland and wetlands in the wake. You want an Ontario that champions smart growth within existing urban boundaries through gentle densification to give people more housing choices. My children and yours deserve, deserve a home they can afford where they want to live. I'm running because as a farmer, I see the destruction of farmland that we will never get back. The Ford government would spend billions on highways paving, up, paving over farms instead of taking real leadership in building affordable, healthy, and connected communities. We can create neighbor-focused communities where we live, work, play, and shop locally. But mostly, I stand before you today because of my three children and my grave concern for the world we are leaving them. This is not the Ontario I want, the Ontario you want, or the leadership we need. We need an Ontario where mental health is health and where mental health services are available to everyone under OHIP without outrageous wait times. Finally, the Ontario Greens are the only party with a real and honest climate plan, a real plan with real solutions. The best plan for a new climate economy is a green plan, one that slashes energy bills, provides incentives for electric vehicles, ceases endless commutes, and creates good green jobs. On June 2, vote green. Vote for Danielle Valiquette. All right, thank you very much, Danielle.
And now you have met all of our candidates. Uh, thank you to uh, those who are able to be here tonight. Uh, sorry to those who are not able to be here tonight. And to, to all of you, good luck in the debate tonight, the, the forum. Good luck in the election. And thank you very much for all taking the time to run and try to make a difference. It's much appreciated. Uh, again, these questions, the first group of questions tonight, uh, we will stick with these until about 8 o'clock. We'll try to get them all in if we have time. Everyone is going to get an opportunity to answer first. Uh, we started the introductions in the order that you drew your numbers. We are going to move to number two through one to go through the next one, and then three through one as we go on through questions and questions. I'll let you know when it's your turn. You'll have 90 seconds. We have our timers over here. You'll get a sign that goes up at 30 seconds. When the stop sign goes up, I will let you know and then your microphone will be cut. If that doesn't work, we have a shock thing under your seat. I, trust me, it's not that bad. I tested it out myself before, you'll be fine. Just getting about the shock thing. Uh, but everything else is true. So uh, do respect the time, do respect each other, please. So 90 seconds each. Uh, we are gonna start uh, with Rick Byers from the Ontario PC. All the questions are the same. If you need me to repeat the questions, don't uh, hesitate to ask, I'm happy to do so. The first question is, what will your party do to make housing more affordable and accessible for middle class and working families in Bruce Gray, Owen Sound? Well, thank you for that question. And as I'm out knocking on doors, and so far I've knocked on over 2,600 doors in our community all over the place, this is a question that comes up a lot. And at the end of the day, the biggest issue fueling the housing crisis is not enough homes. That's why the government introduced legislative, regulatory, and policy change to help build new homes in Ontario. This approach is working. Our housing supply plan helped over 100,000 new homes start construction last year, the highest in more than 30 years or any time during the previous government. But cooperation with county and municipal governments will also be important in getting housing built. I attended Ian Body's Mayor's Luncheon last week, run by the Chamber. And Mayor Body talked about Owen Sound having 2,500 housing units in the process of approval or construction. I commend the City for taking such action, and I look forward to working with them and other municipalities in Grey Bruce to move, to move forward, making increased housing opportunities available in our communities. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Rick Byers, Ontario PC Party. Uh, next to answer will be Joseph Westover of the Populist Party of Ontario. Well, we're having an immigration influx from the Trudeau government and thus giving us the housing issue. So that would be something to address would be less immigration. Instead of going up to 450,000 a year when we're already having a housing problem, I think we're doing about 250,000. He's gonna almost double it. So it's just going to continue to make a problem. I don't really agree with um, Canada setting up a system with housing for the less fortunate when the less fortunate is the common man. We need to have housing uh, in a price range that, you know, the common man can buy one, right? A million dollars a house is a little bit outrageous. Um, and world speculation on our lands in uh, Canada need to stop so that we can actually own our own land again. That's what we'd work on, so. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, next to answer the question is going to be Selwyn Hicks of the Liberal Party. Thank you. <clears throat> Those of you who know me will know that as warden, um, two years ago, I called uh, for the county to take bold action on affordable housing. Why? Because just about every group that came uh, to the county and made delegations were talking about the fact that we need to address affordable housing. And so we did, and we did take uh, a bold move. We established a, an affordable housing fund for the first time, uh, where excess funds uh, from the sale of property that's um, no longer uh, necessary for the use of the county will go directly into that pot used for affordable housing. And we established a 1% tax levy. Uh, forever, by the way. Every year, 1% of the tax levy will go towards affordable housing. And so this is an issue 
that I'm very passionate about and I'm very proud of my record on bringing people together to address this very tough and complex uh, issue. What we know and what we've learned is that affordable housing of all types are needed. So we need uh, attainable housing for that you know, young couple that wants to get in housing for the very first time. We need assisted um, uh, housing for those who are struggling with perhaps mental health or addictions and need uh, services right on hand. And then we need housing with assistance. Uh, that may be available close by or in, in the community. So all of those together, the Liberals are going to join with municipalities to build 1.5 million homes. And later on, I'll be able to talk more about time. that. And that is time. Mr. Hicks, thank you. All right, next is going to be from the NDP, Karen Gebentner. <laughs> thank you. The NDP believes housing is a human right, and I believe that as well. Unfortunately, the things the Conservatives have been doing is not helping make our homes more affordable. I have a, a daughter who's going off to college uh, next year, and it won't be long before she needs a, a place to live. So affordable housing really is forefront of my mind, even in my own life right now. There are things that we can do, and the government can do, to make our houses more affordable. For one thing, we can bring back rent control, and also end vacancy decontrol, that means that when someone moves out of an apartment or a rental house, that the next tenants moving, back, moving in would pay the same as the previous tenants rather than them being able to, uh, to spike up the rent. We can help the first time home buyers with their down payment. The NDP government would build 100,000 new affordable units and 60,000 supportive units. Those are just a few things that we would do to help make our housing more affordable. Thank you very much, Karen. And uh, next we will go to Danielle Valiquette of the Green Party. Thank you so much. We need homes, not highways. We can't afford to wait. The Ontario you want includes deeply affordable housing that champions smart growth within existing urban boundaries through gentle densification. That infills housing by streamlining zoning to allow for houses like triplexes and duplexes, giving people more housing options. We need leadership to remove the blind bidding process to create a system that is more transparent, as well as create a province-wide tax on those who own multiple properties or, um, or are leaving homes vacant. Houses that could be freed up homes for first-time home buyers. We are in a crisis, and a house should be a home, not somebody's investment portfolio. Thank you very much, Danielle Valiquette, Green Party. Uh, our next uh, candidate to answer will be our last one for this first question, and that is Suzanne Coles of the Ontario Party. Thank you very much. In 2018, the Conservatives stated that they were going to make sure housing is more affordable when you go out to buy a home. Another broken promise. The Ontario Party will be introducing sweeping urban planning reform to adjust single-family zoning in Ontario's most housing-deprived cities. In particular, property owners will be given more freedom to construct two- and four-unit residential buildings in neighbourhoods traditionally reserved for single-family homes. We will adjust immigration rates and settlement patterns with the ultimate outcome of reducing unsupportable housing demand in many of Ontario's urban areas. We will seek the same right for immigration policy as the province of Quebec. We'll establish an Ontario-focused foreign purchasing ban on res residential homes. When I look at Gray County in particular, I see in Owen Sound, for example, multiple buildings that are sitting empty, factories, storage areas that are no, long, no longer being used. Those are buildings that could be utilized and retrofitted and renovated to make affordable housing units rather than spending the time and the money to build unaffordable units. We could put in cooperatives where people could take control and have pride of rental and pride of their community. These are the things that we're going to be doing to make sure that everybody has a proper home to live in. 
Thank you very much. Suzanne Coles, Ontario Party. That is the first question from the Advoc Advocacy Committee tonight. Uh, we're going to go on to question two. Again, we're moving down the order uh, and those that answered, which means the first to answer this next question will be Joseph Westover of the Populist Party of Ontario. Uh, the question for all of the candidates, if elected, what will you do to house people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness? And Joseph, you will have 90 seconds. Um, that's difficult to do because the homeless are trouble on their own. They have a lot of the mental disorders. So um, other than that, if you're dealing with just the poor people, well, I definitely don't think that we have a welfare system that's set up that uh, matches any dignity to the human worth. So uh, I think it might be around 800 bucks a month or something like that. You can't live on that. And so a lot of that ends up uh, turning into a legal activity if you end up being in that state because now you have to survive and eat and you can only pay your rent. So we have to stop things from progressing in an expensive manner. And I don't believe that uh, building more uh, taxpayers' expenses, uh, which only creates more debt, is going to help more people get out of being poor. I think we're making more homeless people. So we need to get to a point where we have property come down in price that we can afford it. That's what it has to be. So, Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, next to answer the question will be Selwyn Hicks. Sorry, thank you. <clears throat> this is an issue I know uh, very, very well, having been the warden of the, uh, for the county. I can tell you uh, that what is needed is wraparound services because these are people with not just housing issues and if we're going to talk about dignity we have to look at the whole person so yes they need to have that basic thing something above their head uh, but at the same time we need to take them where they're at and we need to let them know that there are options uh, that we can have wraparound services so our social services workers are going to be shifting. They're going to be going back to a more traditional role where they actually are doing less paperwork and more of the social services navigating. So to help these people to navigate the web of social services and to figure out what the priorities are. So number one, let's get you stabilized, but maybe there are other issues. It could be mental health. It could be drugs and addiction. Whatever that is, we're going to take you where you're at and we're going to take you to that next level so you can prepare a plan, a plan that's dignified, a plan that gets you to reach your full potential, whatever that might be. Thank you very much, Mr. Hicks. Uh, next, we will go to Karen Gaventer of the NDP. Uh, first of all, we'll restore the goal of ending chronic homelessness within 10 years, and that's a, a commitment. Um, besides that, People think of homelessness and you think of the homeless on the street. What people don't think of is someone who's couch surfing. That is also a form of homelessness. And we need to address those as well. Um, we need to make sure that life is more affordable. So those people who are couch surfing or have several families in one house because they can't afford to move out on their own, to be able to afford that. Um, we've already talked about having more affordable housing. We need to raise the minimum wage so that people can afford life, including housing. Um, we would work with communities to address the various uh, causes of homelessness. Today I was actually at the uh, Community Foundation Vital Signs uh, presentation uh, just downstairs that was talking about affordable housing in Grey Bruce. And uh, there was a lot discussed there about what's needed um, and we need to work with those organizations to address the, the fundamental needs to make sure that people are housed. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, next, we will go to Danielle Valiquette of the Green Party. Thank you, JC. So the Green Party of Ontario has a housing first strategy. Could you imagine all the issues that would be solved if when anybody, whenever anybody walked in and became part of the process, they were asked, do you have a roof over your head? Once the next step is taken, there would be wraparound health service, services, which would also include mental health services. I'd like to take a minute to talk a little bit about ODSP. 
The Green Party of Ontario is the only party who is willing to take ODSP, so the Ontario Disability Service Program, and double it, which is exactly what, what all the advocacy groups are asking for, and then increase that along with inflation. Right now, ODSP is about $1,100 a month. Basically, that's legislated poverty. Additionally, and related to mental health, the Green Party of Ontario would decriminalize uh, drugs so that it is a health issue and not a justice system issue. Thank you very much, Danielle. Uh, next, we will go to Suzanne Coles of the Ontario Party. Thank you. We have a severe issue of homelessness in Gray County. And homelessness, drug addiction, and mental health concerns are all usually intertwined. They all have to be addressed together in a group. The problem that comes into play is people who are suffering from homelessness, mental health issues, or addiction frequently get caught up in the criminal justice system. And the criminal justice system is not a place to provide assistance. If I'm elected, I will be making every effort possible to look at an innovative type of program where we have people who are suffering from any of those would be able to get solid housing where they could get support for mental health issues and support for addiction. For those who are going through the criminal justice system in a revolving door fashion, those people, perhaps they could be in, a, in an area where it's locked but not jail, where they'll be provided with a room, where they'll be provided with hope, with counseling, support system, addiction services, so that they can get back on their feet again, start to feel good about themselves, and they can get back into the mainstream population with a solid goal and solid foundation and structures. And that is something that we have to really all as a community work towards if we're going to end this homelessness. And it doesn't have to come at a really expensive cost. As I indicated with housing, we have a lot of buildings that are sitting empty. We need to utilize that. And that is time. Thank you, Suzanne. And uh, our final candidate to answer this question will be Rick Byers of the Ontario PC Party. Thank you. I'm glad we're discussing this issue. It's an important one for all of our communities, and it's different in the different parts of Gray County, whether we're here in Own Sound or, or in other communities. And there are, other, are mental, uh, many elements to this, as has been mentioned by others. One of them is mental health. And the government was the first to introduce a ministerial department of mental health, health in the last uh, session, which is a very important development and, and puts mental health as a priority. Another element in our own community, there was a recent announcement that Bill Walker made with uh, an important one for, with Grey Bruce Health Services for uh, 36 new treatment beds in our community. As Gary Sims, CEO of Grey Bruce Health Services, said, it was the biggest mental health investment in decades. Housing is part of the solution too. Folks here have mentioned attainable housing, and I think that's it's a part of the solution as well. And I would certainly uh, look to work with municipalities and the counties to try and find a solution there. And so and I would be honored to work with you as warden post June 2nd uh, <laughs> in that regard. Uh, anyhow, it's an important topic, and I look forward to uh, uh, finding a solution with partners that work. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, the first shot of the night has been fired, apparently. It was a nice one, though. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Our, uh, that concludes all of the second question for the night from the committee. Uh, the next question, the first to answer, will be Selwyn Hicks of the Liberal Party. Uh, the question for all the candidates, our pandemic experience demonstrates that Ontario's health care system is too small and needs more staff. What will you do to fill this gap in a timely way? Uh, Mr. Hicks, you have 90 seconds. Thank you very much. So you, the, the question is quite right. That. Boy, we sure learned a lot uh, from the pandemic, didn't we, uh, about what was good and the areas that need uh, support uh, with our health care system. Uh, and I got to tell you this, um, health care workers uh, were the absolute heroes. Uh, and we call them heroes, but we have a bill in place that restricts 
uh, their income. How could we call them heroes and at the same time slap them in the face and tell them you were going to hold your income uh, where it is? That's just not fair. A liberal government is going to change that. We're going to repeal that bill and we're going to treat health care workers with dignity. <laughs> Again, I keep repeating that word. Um, secondly, <clears throat> I'm really proud uh, to say that locally uh, we have not just identified that we're in grave uh, need of nurses, but we've actually done something about it. We've lobbied uh, quite heavily and worked in partnership with Georgian College, and we have uh, our very first uh, nursing four-year degree program right here in Owen Sound starting in September. And by the way, it's, it's oversubscribed already. So that just shows you that the interest is here. We're going to have homegrown uh, nurses who will be available to us. We're not going to send them away to Toronto for their training, and they'll be available where they're needed right here in Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Hicks. Uh, next to answer, we will go to Karen Gaventer of the NDP. One of the issues that I've heard about at doorsteps is health care. And our health care system is broken, and we need to fix it. For one thing, we need to reinvest in it. We've, there's been too many cuts. We need to make sure that hospitals are adequately funded and that their funding increases with inflation with, as their costs go up. Experts say we need to hire at least 10,000 PSWs and 30,000 nurses, and we would do that. One of the issues that comes out of the COVID-19 pandemic is that there is a backlog of surgeries and procedures that we need to clear. And the decisions that the Ontario government make can make an impact on that. We can run the surgeries and procedures longer times in evenings and weekends and clear that backlog. There are many things that we can do, and we need to invest in our health care system. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Next up will be Danielle Valaquette of the Green Party. The pandemic has exposed the cracks in our health system. I think we all are um, aware of that. The Green Party of Ontario would hire 33,000 nurses. On top of that, we would also pay PSW, so personal service workers, who um, are, are the uh, women who helped um, through uh, at the long-term uh, care homes, $25, along with ECEs as well. In addition to taking care of long-term uh, care homes, the Green Party of Ontario would also invest in aging at place strategies so that parents can live at home with the people who love them and who care for them. I uh, had uh, the fortunate um, uh, experience of teaching at uh, Sheridan College and I had the incredible experience of teaching PSWs and these women work so hard for very little pay for very long hours and they deserve our respect and they can they deserve to be to be con uh, to moving forward for us to be able to respect them, and I believe that should be done through a wage that is livable. And that is time, and I believe you're done. So that's perfect. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, next to answer will be Suzanne Coles of the Ontario Party. Thank you. Yes, we we have a health care crisis, and this has been going on for years. And yet, when the pandemic struck, the Conservative Party, in their infinite wisdom, fired or laid off hundreds if not thousands of health care workers, nurses and doctors. The Ontario Party will enact legislation to have all health care workers who have been terminated due to COVID policies return to their jobs immediately. We will permit non-profit organizations and private corporations to build, own and manage hospitals and will permit citizens to hold supplemental private medical insurance. We'll provide funding for greater public hospital bed capacity and the hiring of thousands more health care workers. We will streamline the process for accreditation of foreign trained health care professionals who have been trained in jurisdictions with similar accreditations as Canada. We will open up more spots in Canadian medical schools which have been notoriously challenged to gain entry. 
Many smart, young, prospective Canadian medical students are traveling to schools in Ireland and the Caribbean and elsewhere and then finding jobs in the United States. It's time to keep these smart students here at home. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Uh, Rick Byers of the Ontario PC Party is next. Thank you. And certainly the pandemic for the last two and a half years has been a most difficult time for our society. Everyone has been affected by the global pandemic, healthcare workers, schools, businesses, and families. We have had a challenging time. And it does make, it look, make us look at our healthcare system. What can we fix? What can we do? Our answer is continue to invest. The PC government is increasing health care spending more than any government in the history of Ontario. $59.3 billion in 2019-20, up to 64.1, 21-22. And that investment will continue. $27 billion over 10 years for hospital projects that will create 3,000 new beds. 30,000 new long-term care beds that will be built and take the strain off our hospitals. And we are investing in frontline health workers. And in our own community, there's a lot of exciting things happening in health care. The new hospital coming up in Markdale, we see that in our community. It's going to be an exciting opening next year. I also mentioned the investment in, in addiction services through Grey Bruce Health Services. And as Selwyn said, the Georgian College nursing, nursing Program. Lots happening, lots of investment in health care, but to keep it going and improve our service. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. And uh, the final one to answer this question will be Joseph Westover of the Populist Party of Ontario. I think to uh, help health care, we need to get rid of the PC party, absolutely. Um, they've made, they've made uh, a lot of things go wrong. They didn't need to go wrong. Was there a problem in hospitals with being overrun? No, there wasn't. That was a media thing. We had people going around recording it when they said it was happening, and it wasn't full. There wasn't a, 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 a pandemic in hospitals overrunning it. That's not what was going on. Um, there's lots of evidence out there to show that that's just the media hype. Um, the lockdowns they gave us, uh, as well as the mask mandates and the vaccine passports, were all unconstitutional. It shouldn't have happened. Okay? It's not a trustworthy government. I think that outside of all that, absolutely, we've had a problem with health care outside of any pandemic or imagined pandemic. There's always been a problem with health care. And I know from the time that my mom was uh, the head of uh, Wyerton and Lions Head Hospital, uh, one of the heads anyways, um, she got let go by some of the parties here. Um, and they cut a bunch of nurses off the, off the roster back then. And then you have the PCs doing it again, and that's causing our health care problem. I definitely think we should be hiring people back and get the, the hospitals functioning. Thank you very much, Joseph. Our next question from the committee will be answered first by Karen. Uh, the question is, there is an urgent need to transform long-term care, including enhancing capacity, funding, and safety. If you agree with this assessment, what will your party do to bring about fundamental involvement? Karen, you have 90 seconds. First of all, over 4,000 people died in long-term care homes during COVID-19. Three quarters of those were in for-profit homes. What's happened? is the Ford government, the Conservative government, has been giving those for-profit homes the benefit. They've been getting 30-year contract extensions. We need to make sure we stop that. So one of the things that we will do is move the system to be for, not for-profit and a public system. That's one thing we would do. We also would make sure that residents have minimum four hours a day care. That's something the NDP has been fighting for for years. We would increase the number of beds. And something else that is associated with it is to invest in our home care system. Because if we can help people stay at home, which is where a lot of them would rather stay than going into long-term care facilities, then that puts less pressure on the long-term care facilities. Thank you very much, Karen. Eventer, 
of the NDP. Next to answer the question will be Danielle Valiquet of the Green Party. Thank you. So the Green Party of Ontario would not allow for long-term care homes to become privatized. We would, as I spoke about earlier, we would support PSWs as well as nurses by creating more nursing jobs as well as paying uh, PSWs accordingly, so $25 an hour. We would also repeal, as, as Mr. Hicks spoke about, repeal Bill 124 that essentially caps a nurse's a salary at 1%. That is below inflation. And as I spoke about earlier, we would also uh, spend money, $1.2 billion, on ensuring that people can age in place. Now, this sounds like a lot of money, but this is a whole lot less money than bringing people to long-term care homes. Or what is happening nowadays is people are spending time in emergency rooms, which is way more expensive than both of the other options. Thank you very much, Danielle. Uh, next to answer the question will be Suzanne Coles of the Ontario Party. Thank you. First of all, the one, one thing that I would be certainly pushing for is legislation that prohibits the government from using pension funds to support other expenditures. Currently in Canada, the current and past governments have been spending pension money for decades to the point that now it's virtually zero. There's no money left for seniors. I would be exploring under the public system vouchers which would allow families to use the money allotted to make a determination on whether or not their loved one wanted to be in private, public, or home care. We would look at grants to allow family members to take educational programs in elder care so that they can keep their family members at home. Grants to retrofit the homes to accommodate the seniors. Keeping seniors with their families wherever possible provides significant benefits to their overall health as well as family relationships. We need to end the abuse occurring in long-term care homes. With the pandemic, we've seen so many senior citizens, hundreds of them die from loneliness and neglect. And that will end. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Uh, next to answer the question will be Rick Byers of the Ontario PC Party. Thank you. There have been huge investments in long-term care in our Grey Bruce community in the last four years from Bill Walker and the PC government. Green Gables, Grey Gables, excuse me, Rockwood Terrace, Meaford, Hanover, Owen Sound, and Lion's Head have all had significant investments. There will be 478 new beds and 480 redeveloped beds for a total of 958 in our community. That is more than the 611 beds that the previous government did in all of Ontario from 2011 to 2018. It's a major investment in long-term care here in Grey Bruce. Province-wide, the government is investing 6.4 billion, as I mentioned earlier, to create 30,000 new beds. And there will also be 4.9 billion invested to hire 27,000 new care staff and increase daily direct care to four hours per resident per day. Folks, these are historic investments in long-term care, needs to happen and will be happening, and I look forward as your MPP to be part of that important process. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, next to answer will be Joseph Westover of the Populist Party of Ontario. Can you uh, re-ask the question? Certainly. Uh, the question is, there is an urgent need to transform long-term care, including enhancing capacity, funding, and safety. If you agree with this assessment, what will your party do to bring about fundamental improvement? Yeah, that's what I thought it was. Okay, so um, my dad was here in Lee Manor and died in Lee Manor th during the lockdowns, all right? We weren't allowed to visit him for about two months when he got put in there. And when we got to him, he was held in a chair to sleep in, his feet were puffed up so bad from lack of blood circulation that liquid was coming at the tops of his feet and they were putting bandages on them because they only had four hours that they could attend to him. And he would get up and he would fall out of bed. 
So that's what you got. You put them in long-term care, and you got four hours where someone might attend your, your uh, disabled or incapable elderly person, or maybe even you, when you get there. It just doesn't suit at all. It's disgusting. Um, it's not something I think that's dignified at all. I definitely think we need to fund it huge. So, and certainly PSWs, yep, like crazy. We need a lot of them in there. So, that's good. Thank you, Joseph. And the last one to answer this candidate will be Selwyn Hicks of the Liberal Party. So thank you. I started off uh, by talking about dignity, and here we go. I haven't met a senior yet that has told me that they look forward to the day when they're going to go to a long-term care facility. If that person exists, please show them to me because I haven't found that person yet. And so the Liberal Party is going to listen to seniors, and we're going to transform long-term care. We're going to transform it by listening to seniors and making the priority home care. So with that said, we're going to create 400,000 more uh, uh, opportunities for seniors to get support in home, where they want to be, where they're comfortable, for as long as possible. And when they do need to go to long-term care, we're going to make sure that it's treated more like hospital care, which frankly, the acuity level, the way it is, that's what it is. It's not the seniors' homes of the past, of 10, 15 years ago. The acuity level is so high uh, that we need professionals in there capable of taking care of these people. And so with that said, anyone who has the capability of being a doctor or a nurse or, frankly, a, a personal support uh, worker, if they live in a rural community under the Liberal uh, government, your education will be paid for. Because we need you and we respect you and we're going to repeal, again, Bill 124. We're not going to call you heroes and then freeze your salary. That's just not fair. And that is time. Thank you, Selwyn. That uh, concludes our fourth question tonight. Our uh, next question will be answered first by Danielle Veliquette of the Green Party. Uh, this question has to do with inflation. Inflation is accelerating, not subsiding. What will your party do both to address its punishing impact on families and businesses, and how will you bring it under control? Thank you. So I'm going to use Selwyn's word for the day, which is dignity. And I think uh, when we talk about um, when we talk about inflation, essentially what we are talking about is cost of living increases. And so I did uh, touch a little bit about uh, ODSP and how the Green Party of Ontario is the only party who would double the, as the advocacy groups are asking for, double ODSP. Uh, uh, payments as well as keep up with inflation. But I tell you what we will not do because it's the wrong idea for the environment. What we won't be doing is subsidize gas taxes and um, increasing greenhouse gas emissions because of the cost of living. That isn't the right idea. That isn't how we want to move over, move forward in a new climate economy. Thank you very much, Suze, uh, Danielle. Uh, next, we will go to Suzanne Coles of the Ontario Party. Thank you. As far as the inflation is concerned, we need to look at what the wages are, increase the minimum wage wherever possible. But we need to look at one of the reasons for the inflation. And in no small part, a lot of that is the immigration. We will put immigration controls. They're purchasing houses, which is making it outside of the reach of the average Canadian to, to afford housing. We need to look at the gas situation. Currently, right now, the cost of fuel is $1.99 per litre. The cost of bar a barrel of oil is $99 per barrel. In 2013, it was $1.30 a litre, and a, a barrel was $97 virtually the same price per barrel, but our gas has gone up exponentially. We need to look at the taxing situation on the fuel. If we can reduce that, we can certainly look then at less costs for many of the day-to-day -day things that we need to purchase. We need to look at sustainability in farming and encourage local farming and local purchasing. 
and not importing so many items from other countries that we could be dealing with here and producing here, which would increase jobs and lower prices. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, next up is Rick Byers, Ontario PC Party. Well, inflation is certainly an issue that I've been hearing a lot about at the doors as we meet, meet voters in our community. And whether it's the price of the gas pumps, buying a home, a car, groceries, or basic necessities, inflation is hitting us hard right now. PC government has done a number of things to put more money in your pocket over the last while, lowering gas tax by 5.7 cents coming up in July. That's on top of the 4.3 that was already done. Scrapping the license plate fees for 8 million people, introducing $10 a day daycare, and increasing the general minimum wage to 15 and uh, 50 come October. But employment is also part of the solution. We have a comprehensive employment and training agenda which will help people find jobs and upgrade to better jobs to help manage through this period of price pressure. You know, it's a global phenomenon. phenomenon. It's going on everywhere and, and the solutions aren't easy, but here are some, there are some small steps we've taken put cash in your pocket, hope we get through this and back to uh, what we saw previously as soon as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, next to answer will be Joseph Westover of the Populist Party of Ontario. <laughs> I would say to start with, the front row of candidates are the problem for our inflation. Uh, every one of them, and they continue to tell you that, oh, well, we're going to raise the ODSP, we'll double that. Where's that money coming from? Okay, do you know what it does? That makes inflation. Every time they want to build something new, every time they want to do something along those lines, it's so great and sounds so good. Every time they're doing that, they're making the cost of living go up because they're borrowing that money, which makes our dollar of no value. Okay, and it's got to stop. We have to be able to be reproducing money ourselves in a workforce, getting people independent, that's what we need. We need a strong uh, GDP or, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Like, that's what has to happen here. We need to get everybody together working, not everybody on social systems and not owner owning anything or where the Green Party would suggest, well, to help you live. I know you bought a property and you have the right to own that property, but really to now what we're going to do is change that community you, you bought in for the value you bought in and you, you now have people building apartments all around you and you have a cluster uh, zone in, in your, your place that was not to be a cluster zone and you bought it specifically to have a nice, a nice part of town. So that's not acceptable either. They're violating certain rights of, of ownership and uh, degrading things. So as far as... Uh, and oh, that I is stop time. Saying. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, next we will go to Selwyn Hicks of the Liberal Party. <clears throat> I gotta tell you, I have a hard time biting my tongue after listening to that. Uh, growing up poor, I know fully well that nobody wants to be in a circumstance where they're trying to survive on $1,100 a month. When you're paying 70 or 80 percent of your income going strictly to housing and you've got a pittance uh, left, golly, we, we shouldn't be pointing the fingers at the poor. They need help, they need dignity, they need love, and they need an opportunity to reach their full potential. I'm living proof of that. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm supposed to talk about what liberals are going to do, right? Well, on ODSP, uh, we are going to increase ODSP by 20 percent, and Ontario Works by 10 percent. The uh, $10 a day daycare, uh, by the way, um, it's great that that's in, but the Conservatives waited until the very last second. So what we're going to do is we're going to make those savings retroactive to January uh, 1st. And we're going to hold the richest people resp most responsible. So individuals with income over $500,000 a year, yeah, we're going to ask them to pay their fair share. And corporations uh, with income of a, uh, above a billion dollars a year, yeah, we're going to be looking at you to pay your fair share. Our Buckaride transportation is going to help a lot of people. And that is time. Thank you, Selwyn.
And uh, next to answer will be Karen Gaventer of the NDP. Um, first of all, it's uh, interesting to hear um, someone talk. They, uh, before the Conservatives, the Liberals had plenty of years to implement some of these things, and I haven't seen those, um, those improvements made. So uh, I hope that they mean it. Um, investing in people helps the economy and helps make our life more affordable. When we're talking about inflation, really we're talking about affordability. Uh, there's a few things that the NDP would do. One is to regulate gas prices. That helps at the pumps. That also helps with food prices because a lot of the food is transported by a gasoline-powered uh, vehicle or a diesel-powered vehicle. We've already talked about housing we can afford. It is imperative that we have homes that people can afford to live in. Another part of this is making sure that people are paid enough that they can afford to live. And the, uh, the minimum wage, the $15 minimum wage, was canceled by the Conservatives a few years ago. And now they're saying how wonderful it is when minimum wage, $15 minimum wage is nowhere near a living wage. An NDP government would raise it to $20, but also help small, small businesses so they can afford to pay their staff and to uh, bridge that change. Thank you, Karen. And that concludes uh, the fifth question from the committee. Uh, we are going to ask one more committee question to all of our candidates, and then we're going to move on to submitted questions. We have a number of submitted questions, so thank you very much to members of our audience uh, for putting forward their questions. Uh, again, this last question does come from the committee. Uh, Suzanne Coles of the Ontario Party is going to have the opportunity to answer first. The question is, what steps will your party take to support sustainable farming enable future farmers, and preserve farmland. Suzanne, you have 90 Thank seconds. You. Our party, the Ontario Party, will be enacting legislation to prevent foreign purchasers from purchasing farmland in Ontario. We're going to put this legislation through that will make it mandatory that you must be a resident of Ontario in order to purchase this land. We're finding too many farms are being purchased by foreign investors and then not being used for farmland and it's just sitting vacant. Further to that, when we look at um, the farming, we would be, or I certainly would be looking at promoting hemp. Hemp is more bio, more and more efficient bioenergy feedstock than domestic animal crops. It's more energy efficient to grow and harvest with less pesticides required. From an ecological position, this is one of the best crops that we could be looking at to grow. We can also look at using that for fiber-based products, such as paper and textiles. Even so much as a product called hempcrete, which is a cement replacement, guaranteed to be bug-free and last longer than concrete, with absolutely almost zero emissions. We need to look at supporting our local farmers and finding ways that they can biodiversify that they can continue with the traditions of farming and make money in doing so. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Uh, now we are going to move on to some submitted questions. Uh, again, the uh, candidates will each get to answer the question and we'll have 90 seconds to do so. Sorry? I would like to answer These that. are the specific candidates? but oh, okay. none of us. The rest of us. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm getting all kinds of questions handed to me and I've lost my place. My apologies. Uh, the uh, next one to answer will be Rick Byers of the Ontario Thank PC you. Party. <laughs> I, as part of my activities as a candidate in the last while, knocking on a lot of doors, did I mention over 2,600 so far? Um, but I've also been meeting with business owners and I've met with agricultural owners as well. And that's been very, very informative. And I met with um, some farmers down in the whole scene area who have huge operations. And I have been very impressed with the connection they have for the environmental linkage to their activities. One of, them, one of the farmers has a solar farm on his property. He says it's the best area for grazing sheep ever. So there's a, a great link. All I'm saying is here, environmental, so I don't have uh, the specific answer here. What I'll do is continue these com conversations with the agricultural community and, and 
push them for solutions in this area because I know they got them. I look forward to working with them and bringing them forward. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Next to answer will be Joseph Westover of the Populist Party of Ontario. Um, I think what we're dealing with once again is inflation. So we've got a cost of living going up, which makes uh, farming difficult to make money at. And then they have to charge higher prices for food to us, which makes our life terrible. <laughs> and we can't afford that. And part of that problem also, not only just inflation, is also the gas prices. Um, just running equipment all day long is killing people, right? So including truckers who deliver your food and the farmers who are trying to grow your food. So I think inflation has to be attacked big time and our party is certainly dead set against uh, allowing it to continue to grow. It's going to have to be reduced so that our cost of living can be actually affordable. It's, uh, I don't really like the word sustainable. Um, sustainable development to me is, is part of a problem of why Ontario Hydro is expensive, right? Because now we've got for-profit business in our own uh, tax-paid hydro. It should be run for us for no profit, right? And we should have our costs down as low as possible. Instead, we've got someone in there looking to make a profit off of us now, too. So we got to just cut, cut costs as much as we can, and most of that's going to be with carbon tax, getting rid of it out of Ontario, and certainly closing down a lot of government that's just overhanging there for no reason. So... All right. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, next to answer will be Selwyn Hicks of the Liberal Party. Thank you. Uh, it might surprise some of you to hear that I have a farming background. Uh, so back in the day, I lived on a dairy farm in Stainer, Ontario, um, near Sunnydale Corners, just on the other side of the border, a uh, large uh, dairy operation. Look, let me say this. Farming and agriculture is so important to Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. We need to take care of our farmers and we need to listen to them. And if we've been listening to them, what we would hear is that they're happy uh, that development is, if you, if you plan properly, proper planning says, you focus development in primary settlement areas. What that does is allows for expansion in the area where the services already exist, the infrastructure, but it also protects farmland. Uh, and so that's critical. Uh, if we listen to farmers, we're going to hear that they are concerned about broadband. And I have been fighting for the last three, four years very hard to get broadband expanded, not just because it's a luxury, but because many farm operations today are very sophisticated and rely on uh, broadband. So we need to support those internet service providers that are going to go up uh, those laneways to provide service to six or seven customers. And last, they're concerned about mental health. My time is up, so I'll, <laughs> I'll say more on that uh, another time. Thank you, Selwyn. Uh, next, we'll go to Karen Gaventer of the NDP. Um, it's interesting to hear about uh, broadband. The NDP has been fighting for broadband uh, accessibility for years and years and years. Um, so that is one thing that we would do to help our farmers and uh, everyone that lives in the rural areas. Um, we need to protect our fa farmland. Unfortunately, the green belt and the farmland has been uh, threatened with development. And our farms are what feed us. Uh, without our farms, we don't have food. So they are absolutely vital. Uh, not to mention that the farmers are, have a connection to the environment and are environmental stewards. One thing we can do is uh, make sure development is infilling in the cities so that we have more development within city boundaries instead of spreading out and out and urban sprawl over the farmland. Other things we can do to support our farmers is to have uh, to support supply management and also we would lift the uh, cap on risk management. We, the other thing we would do is have a grocery code of conduct um, so that monop large monopolistic retailers won't be able to take advantage of the food, re uh, the food um, farmers anymore and uh, that would help uh, the farmers as well. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And the last to answer will be Daniel Valaket of the Green Party. 
Thank you. So the, the one thing that we can do for farmland right now is stop paving over it. So we have enough food, thank you very much. We have enough food right now to feed about six billion people. Do you guys know what the problem with that is? There's 7.1 billion of us. So we need to start supporting farmers and we need to start supporting the local food movement. And so what do farmers care about most? They care about soil. That's our, our currency, that's what we care about. So let's incentivize and celebrate farmers because that, that's who cares about the environment. So how do we do that? We um, incentivize uh, farmers through helping with cash crops, through green fertilizers, through hedgerows. Um, we, uh, we celebrate family farms and we do that through supply management because that keeps farms small. Farming and Gray Bruce, um, Owen Sound should be celebrated because there are very, very few farmers who are farming too large right now. We should be celebrating not only our, our organic farmers, but our beef farmers as well because you know what makes good soil? Poop. I'll end it there. Thank you, Danielle. Try not to make a, a joke on the back end of that one. Uh, <laughs> zing. Uh, so here we are into the next round. So these are going to be questions that have been submitted. Uh, we have a couple of questions that were submitted uh, earlier. This one is coming to you from uh, someone who is a chamber member, also a member of the Canadian Federation of University Women. Uh, the question that they asked, uh, we are going to start, by the way, continuing on, moving down the list. So Rick Byers is going to start with this one. What specific projects and targets will your, your party use to support a climate crisis action plan? Thank you. Uh, let me address what the PC government is doing on climate through some recent announcements that have been made to position our province as a leader in the production of electric vehicles and batteries, at the same time helping to secure high-quality, long-term employment. You heard recent announcements of over $10 billion of investments. Uh, Ontario's first electric vehicle battery plant, creating 2,500 jobs, leading the North American market, retooling of GM's Oshawa and Ingersoll plants, Ford's Oakville assembly complex, and Honda's Alliston plant. We've also partnered with steelmaker DeFasco to replace their coal ovens and blast furnaces with low emission electric furnace. And here in our own community, nuclear power, which is the source of 60% of Ontario's electricity supply, is a perfect fit for the coming growth of electric vehicles. In our own Great Bruce community, Bruce Power and Hydrogen Optimize are great green energy partners. These are all significant and tangible steps in the goal of improving our climate and creating jobs for the future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, next to answer the question will be Joseph Westover of the Populist Party of Ontario. Um, I would say that we get back to work Honestly, the only climate crisis we've got is that um, we had a lot of people lose their businesses and stuff like that going on. As far as Canada being any type of uh, uh, producer of um, CO2 or anything like that, we are absorbing other countries. We are in a negative on that scale. We don't need to be having all these new implementations. If you look it up, it's all written out. The test that's been done, Canada is not a positive influence on our climate going anywhere south. Um, we don't produce enough at all to even worry about it. Um, we could very well be charging other nations um, for absorbing theirs, like China, for instance. You know, like something like that could go on. But we don't need to be implementing all these other things. All these other things. What we need to do is get ourselves comfortable living and enjoy life. Thank you, Joseph. Next to answer is Selwyn Hicks of the Liberal Party. Thank you. Uh, the Liberal Party, to answer the question directly, has set a target of uh, reducing carbon uh, and methane 
by 50 percent by the year 2030. In the process of doing that, we're going to be focusing on uh, 25,000 uh, new green jobs and we're going to transition to a fully clean electrical uh, supply. Uh, you may have heard uh, that uh, we are going to be, uh, if we are elected, we are not going to be supporting Highway 413. Instead, we're going to invest those funds uh, into our education uh, system. About <clears throat> absolutely. About 30% of our land uh, will be designated as protected areas, up from 10%. We're going to be establishing five new provincial parks and planting about a million trees per year uh, for eight years. Uh, and we're going to di divert uh, and recycle 60% of waste from our landfills by 2030, and that target will go up to 85% by 2050. Thank you, Selwyn. Next answer is, or next to answer is Karen Gibenter of the NDP. The Conservatives took away the electric vehicle incentives. They tore out electric vehicle charging stations and they canceled the renewable energy projects. Now they're starting to jump on the bandwagon and say, look at me, look how wonderful I am. And they're starting to bring some of those back after it's getting to be too late. The NDP would reverse all that. We would incentivize electric vehicles and help people purchase them, make sure that there are places to charge those vehicles. We would aim to reach a net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. We would retrofit buildings and help people retrofit buildings. We would also plant one billion trees by 2030. It is imperative that we take this greenhouse, uh, the, the climate emergency seriously. I have two kids. I want to make sure that they have a habitable planet to live on and that all of us, all of our kids and grandkids, have a habitable planet to live on for the years in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Next answer is Danielle Valiquette of the Green Party. Thank you. So the Ontario Greens are the only party with a real and honest climate plan, a real plan with real solutions. And so again, I'm going to tell you one thing. So yep, and a lot of yep, but the one thing that is not in the Green Ontario plan is planting trees because we are way beyond that. Planting trees is not going to save us at this point. What is going to save us is, real, is a real plan with real solutions. What does that include? Our fair share carbon budget. So the Green Party of Ontario will make sure that we are uh, net, uh, net zero free by 2045. We have real solutions that not only will solve the climate crisis, but it will create a whole new climate economy for us. So we will do some of the things that the Liberals and the NDP are talking to you about, but one of those will not be doing things like planting trees because we are way past that, folks. Thank you, Danielle. And last to answer this question will be Suzanne Coles of the Ontario Party. Thank you. Yes, we do have a climate situation that we need to be seriously taking a look at, but we need to be looking at real solutions with real effect. The electric vehicles are not a solution. An electric vehicle requires one ton of, sorry, in mining those, one ton of lithium creates 15 tons of CO2. The lithium being mined predominantly is mined in the Congo, where ch issues of child labour is continuing to rise. When we look at the requirements for the mining and the processing of the lithium, it comes with intense requirements for chemicals and an enormous amount of water. The toxic waste left behind is enormous. Um, the compact battery for a Nissan LEAF, for example, uses about a nine pound lithium battery. If every man, woman, and child were to drive an electric car in the future, we would end up with a lithium shortage. And what you might not realize is a transport truck in optimum conditions would require a 3,000 pound lithium battery for optimum conditions. We need to look and contact scientists and we need to do further research to look at cleaner ways of 
having motor vehicles, there's water-powered motor vehicles, there's patents for that, and nuclear energy, that's the only thing I'm going to agree with Mr. Byers on, is a clean source of energy. But we need to steer away from the electric And that vehicles. is time. Thank you, Suzanne. All right, we will move on to another submitted question. Uh, this con question uh, concerns daycares and families. Uh, the first to answer this question, uh, Rick was the last to go first, so that will be Joseph Westover of the uh, Populist Party of Ontario. He will answer first. The question is, what is your stand on daycare assistance for all families, not just lower income? Joseph? Um, I think if it's required, I think there's no problem with it. That's it. Short and simple. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, next answer will be Selwyn Hicks of the Liberal Party. Could you please repeat the question? Yes. The question is, what is your stand on daycare assistance for all families, not just lower income? Okay. So, again, uh, dignity. Uh, if, if we are, uh, everybody agrees. We love our children. We want the best uh, for our children. No disagreement there. If we want the best for our children, we want our children, when we go to work, to be in the care of competent, well-trained uh, professionals who are compassionate and loving, and so that we can work comfortably knowing that our children are in good hands. Uh, and I can tell you, I have four children. At one point, three of them were in daycare, and it's very expensive. Uh, and I have a decent income. Uh, so if you... Uh, you know, if you're a person who is uh, surviving on a limited uh, income, that's a real challenge. So I think that everybody should be entitled uh, to good, affordable, quality daycare by trained professionals. And by the way, we need them so badly that once again, if you're an ECE person interested in ECE work and you want to go to, uh, and get your training to become a professional, the Liberal government will pay for your tuition. Thank you, Selwyn. Next to answer will be Karen Givetter of the NDP. As I mentioned earlier, I have a daughter who's um, going off to college next year. So it's been a few years, but I still remember how difficult it was to pay for the childcare. There was a time I had two kids in childcare and I had at least a third of my income was paying for that childcare. And just like Selwyn said, my income wasn't a, a really low income. I had a decent job. I have a decent job. So everyone deserves to have access to childcare and affordable childcare. The NDP would deliver universal, public, nonprofit, $10 a day childcare. And beyond that, we want to make sure that our staff in the childcare centers are paid decent wage. They're looking after our kids. They're bringing up our future. So we would immediately increase the wage floor so the minimum that uh, registered and early childhood educators make up to $25 an hour and make sure that all the other program staff would make at least $20 an hour. Thank you, Karen. And next will be Danielle Veliquette of the Green Party. Thank you. So I already touched on how the Green Party of Ontario would uh, pay uh, ECEs $25 an hour. And I am in favor of $10 a day daycare for no matter uh, what your um, financial uh, status is. And the reason for that is, is because the caring of children still today in 2022 falls on women. And I think by providing $10 a day daycare, it, it provides a more equitable uh, an equitable community for everyone. There's also, so as we, as you probably know, the province of Ontario was the last to um, create a subsidized uh, daycare. Um, and the reason for that largely is because the Ford government decided that they will wait until the very end and closer to uh, the, um, the election date uh, for um, uh, PR purposes. So the, um, absolutely, I support a $10 a day daycare. Why? Because it's good for the economy and it's good for women. Thank you, Danielle. Next answer will be Suzanne Coles of the Ontario Party. Thank you. Um, the Ontario Party has a specific platform as it relates to education, and I would be looking to have the same type of program in daycare where parents are provided 
with vouchers based on their tax income that would allow them to choose whether they wish to put their children into publicly funded daycare centers, whether they wish to put them in private daycare, or whether they wish to stay at home and take care of the children themselves. We need to remember as well that we've gone from a society where the, the idea of being a mother was held in incredibly high regard. And parents stayed home, mothers stayed home with their children. And we've gone now where it's more important to spend money to pay for somebody else to raise our children. Women are working so that they can pay almost all of their paychecks to somebody else to take care of their children. We need to look at ways to support parents so that they can stay at home and raise the children in the manner that they feel is the best way to do. But if they can't do that, then we look at a voucher system so that they can choose the best form of daycare to suit their families. Thank you, Suzanne. And next to answer will be Rick Byers of the Ontario PC Party. Thank you. There have been very important commitments to daycare in our Grey Bruce community in the last four years from Bill Walker and the PC government in Durham, Holstein, and up in Tobermory. New facilities that have such a huge impact on our communities. These are great developments. Province wide, as has been noted, the government secured a $13.2 billion with a deal with the Government of Canada that will dramatically reduce fees for parents and provide more accessible, high-quality care available to all for $10 a day. Yes, it was done recently. We didn't do the first deal. We got the best deal done. This agreement will create an additional 86,000 child care spaces and support the hiring of new childhood educators and improve conversation for all staff. This arrangement, together with the Ontario Child Care Tax Credit, affordable child care options, and continued investment in all-day kindergarten, Ontario parents are now provided with the largest array of options, benefits, and supports for early years and child care anywhere in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. All right, our, we are on to another submitted question. Uh, this one is going to go to Selwyn Hicks first. It's his turn. Every candidate will have an opportunity to answer. Uh, this is dealing with a local issue. What is your opinion on TC Energy's pumped storage plant and the large fishery plant in Wyerton? How will you protect our pristine Georgian Bay? Selwyn, you are up first. Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> Suggest the answer right in the question, right? That person make a good lawyer. Uh, let me just say, <clears throat> the TC Energy pro um, Project, in my opinion, is a necessary product. Um, they have uh, listened, from what I can tell, and I've been updated several times as warden. Uh, and the update that I had at the beginning compared to the update that I had about 10 days ago, very, very different. So there is evidence that they are listening to the concerns of those people who are making delegations. It will be a project that will not be visible. It will be a project that will now be further out. Um, it will not uh, cause turbidity. It will not be disturbing uh, the fish. Um, it's going to create a ton of jobs that we desperately need in our area and would benefit from. The housing, the temporary housing, almost like an Olympic village, uh, will be built to support those workers and when they're done the project, guess what? We benefit from that by having that, um, that housing available uh, to our citizens. So bottom line, I support the TC Energy Project and I like the fact that they're listening to people and responding and I'm sure that there will be further changes before the project is actually fully implemented. Thank you, Selwyn. Next answer will be Karen Gaventer of the NDP. Um, the, uh, the question had two parts. One was the TC project and the other was the, the fishery. Um, and uh, the TC project, they are being responsive to concerns of the public. Um, and uh, I actually agree with a lot of what someone was saying, that they are um, making sure there's not going to be turbidity in the water. The amount of heat that's being released into the water is negligible. Um, as there's been concerns, they've reworked the project so that those concerns could be uh, mitigated. Um, it helps with our greenhouse gas emissions because with the, uh, the TC project, it means that 
um, and it helps with our electricity. It means that when we produce more electricity, it can be stored. It's almost like a battery. And when we're producing less electricity, um, then it is uh, released. Um, so more than we need or less than we need. Um, so the main thing though, the main point I would like to say, and actually this is the answer for both of these, is that we need to look at the environmental assessments and make sure that, uh, make for absolute sure, that the neither project is going to negatively affect our environment. Um, I know there's a lot of concerns about the, the fish farm and uh, possible contaminants in the bay, and again, we need to make sure they have a full rigorous environmental assessment to make sure that it's, uh, it's safe for us all. Thank you, Karen. Next to answer is Danielle Valiquet of the Green Party. Thank you. So um, in regards to the Meaford um, pump storage project, uh, yes, I, gr I agree. I, I think that one, uh, we do need these battery um, facilities moving forward as we move off of uh, gas and oil. We will need um, to store uh, to store energy. And I think that uh, TCE, though you might not be surprised to hear, isn't necessarily my favorite company out there, um, but has been fair receptive in some of the changes that they they have made what I would ask is that those groups that have been advocating on behalf of the Bay to please continue to do so because I do think that this is a win for those groups and I guess I really have the same sort of uh, response associated with the um, industrial fish fish farm I do have some concerns about the uh, industrial fish farm. Um, I do have some concerns about the water and the, the quality of water moving forward. And I would um, certainly hope that the environmental assessment that it needs to go through moving forward um, would raise the level of this project, if not just outright stop it. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, next to answer will be Suzanne Coles of the Ontario Party. Thank you. The one thing I'm noting from all of the speakers so far is that nobody's actually indicated that there's been any long-term assessment done on how this will be affected. And when we look at the history of the, pro the progressive conservatives and the liberal, when we look, for example, at the wind energy and how they hastily went in for something that seemed to be a good idea only to find out after the fact that it wasn't effective and it was actually causing more harm than good. I'm currently reminded of other things where it's caused more harm than good but was jumped into hastily because it looked like it would be effective at the time. I'm not going to take a position on this particular project at this time because I have not seen any of the project assessments and I certainly have not seen nor have I heard anybody mention anything about long-term effects to the external environment, but more particularly to the water, to the fish, and all the other species that exist in that water that are vital for the environment all around them. Thank you, Suzanne. Next to answer will be Rick Byers of the Ontario PC Party. Yes, thank you. Glad these two important projects uh, have been raised. Uh, and I agree with some of the comments that have been made so far, uh, firstly with the pump storage. This is the kind of, you know, future green uh, uh, type of project that I really think we need in our, in our community. And listen, um, I, I've, I've heard some of the uh, mayor body at, and, uh, to, to the comments made earlier at mayor body's luncheon again. He was quite clear about the work that TC Energy has done to modify the project and make it less uh, intrusive into the water. Uh, do we have all the details yet? No. There's lots of approvals to go, so, uh, but certainly feels like it's the right kind of project to move forward on. On the fish farm, uh, look, I was up knocking on doors in Wyarton uh, a little while back. We heard this very directly at the door, the concerns about water quality there. Again, there are a lot of approvals to come, but certainly I think if I was up in the community, I'd have the same con uh, concerns. Are the environment assessments appropriate? Is the data from this project something that we can live with or not? Uh, for me, that's pure and simple. Again, I haven't had a chance to have detailed conversations, frankly, about it. I have uh, met with some folks, but that's something, if I'm fortunate enough to be MPP, uh, I will certainly do, because part of the role in looking at these projects is making sure 
you're using these and listening to what's uh, what's being uh, proposed. So and thank you very time. much. Thank you, Rick. Uh, <laughs> finally, to answer this question will be Joseph Westover of the Populist Party of Ontario. Um, well, as the Populist Party of Ontario, if you understand what populist means, it's really about uh, a candidate that uh, is in service to the common people. So uh, what we'd be doing is we'd go out there and assess it, and we'd make sure that whatever's going on, that the cares of the people are met. I don't care how good it is or bad it is for anything. If uh, it's going to destroy or harm people's lifestyle, well, it's the people I represent, and that's what I would stand for. As far as I can see, everybody up here gives a great answer, but nobody here has really got first-hand knowledge of, this, of the actual project. And that's what I would do before I give you an answer on it. I don't know what it's about, like, at its heart. You can just read stuff. You can have hearsay from a mayor and what he thinks about it. You don't really know. So I'd get my hands dirty, I'd get in there and find out what's going on, and I'd find out what the people think, and I'd represent the people uh, for or against the project. Thank you, Joseph. Our next submitted question will go to Karen Gaventer of the NDP First. Uh, this question uh, concerns the Bruce Gray Poverty Task Force. Uh, their question where do you stand on a basic income and or living wage? Um, there was a, a basic income uh, um, pilot project put in place a, a few years ago that unfortunately was cancelled by the Conservative government and uh, an NDP government would put that back in place. We think that it was looking promising and uh, we would check that out. Um, and as far as a living wage, an NDP government would bring the wage up to $20 an hour over four years. And as I mentioned before, we would make sure that we supported small businesses that might struggle with uh, raising that wage. Everyone deserves to have a living wage. Um, and uh, $20 with inflation is going to be the bare minimum and might not even cut it in a few years. So everyone deserves to have a... Uh, um, a decent life. Thank you, Karen. Next to answer will be Danielle Valaquette of the Green Party. I've always kind of um, thought that the Conservatives got rid of the public income pilot because this is such a conservative uh, political theory, economic theory. So I've been criticized today for my um, support of doubling the ODSP. Um, and uh, so this is one of the things, as well as a living wage, um, that are the Green Party of Ontario's first steps towards a universal ba basic income. And the reason for that is, is because when you pay for things up front and you make sure that things are taken care of and people's needs and mental health and health, general health and housing issues are dealt with, then as you move forward, you're not going to have health issues. You're potentially going to have less mental health issues and therefore less addiction issues. So, you know, I, like I said, I, I find it very interesting that it was the PCs that got rid of this, um, this economic incentive that would essentially get rid of a lot of the red tape that they claim to uh, want to rid. Thank you, Danielle. Next to answer will be Suzanne Coles of the Ontario Party. Thank you. There's a significant difference between a guaranteed basic income and a guaranteed wage. The federal Liberals have already proposed that they're going to bring in legislation to a guaranteed income wage, income, sorry, for all Canadians. And what people may not realize, that there are approximately two million people living in Canada under the poverty line. If the federal government was to give them just $500 a month, that works out to $4 billion a month in debt that we would have to pay. And I know that's federal, but when we're looking at it from a provincial perspective, it's the same type of money and the same type of ratio. Everybody deserves to be able to have a wage that will provide them with all of the necessities in life. 
But one of the things we have to look at is what can we do in order to facilitate education and employment so that they can be gainfully employed and earn it and not be in a situation of a basic guaranteed income that requires no employment and no education. That in itself does not give them any hope or perspective for their future. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. Uh, next answer will be Rick Byers of the PC party. Thank you. And I think these questions are very relevant uh, in our stage of having gone through the pandemic just now with, with so many programs at so many different levels that were, uh, that were issued. And so I think is it, appro it is appropriate to look at them. Look, I'll confess, um, I've certainly heard the concept of uh, discussion of a basic income. Um, for me, there's so many programs uh, that are involved in supporting various folks who need them. I think that I'm not equipped at this point to say is this a, a good concept or not. One thing I'd like to do as MPP is look into and make sure I understand the myriad of programs that are there now. Would it make sense to combine them into a basic income? You know, there's arguments for simplicity, etc. So I'll confess uh, that I don't know, but it's something I'd, I'd be keen to look into if I'm fortunate enough to uh, be elected June 2nd. On the living wage, uh, look, I mean, we'll debate about this. I mean, as you've seen, the PC government has established the minimum wage at 15, 50, 15 now, 1550 in October. Obviously, infl inflation pressures are real. We spoke about those or earlier. Should that number be n nudged up? You know, uh, it's a good question. So, so again, something I'll look into if I'm there. And, uh, and thank you for uh, raising these issues tonight. Thank you, Rick. Uh, next, we'll go to Joseph Westover, a Populist Party of Ontario. Um, I think it uh, sounds a little bit like communism to me. Um, certainly nothing uh, that needs to be here. So socialism is the precursor to communism, and that's what's going on here. So the more you've got people who are, you know, getting a basic income, um, the Ontario Party girl here, she's mentioned, they don't have an ability to get off of it. They don't have an education, a skill, or anything else, and there's no incentive to get them off of it. So you're, in essence, just making a population of slaves, okay, that are subject to the government, all right? So under no circumstances am I for it. It would be something I'd go de definitely against, and we need to get people working and have them have the dignity that they provide for themselves. That feeling you have in yourself. All right? So however possible that's done, that's what we need to do. And uh, guess what? When you're working, you can pay tax and we can get our debts paid, you know, instead of always borrowing to help everybody else out. That's what we need to do. And maybe we can even be charitable to those that are in need. All right? Thank you, Joseph. And finally, to answer the question, will be Selwyn Hicks of the Liberal Party? Well, Joseph. It won't surprise you to hear that I couldn't disagree with you more. And by the way, uh, the Poverty Task Force, um, one of my favorite uh, local groups, during the pandemic, if it were not for the Poverty Task Force, a lot of poor people, a lot of struggling people uh, would be in a different place today. They were so good at pulling together the information, at getting it out for people to help them to navigate. Um, what was available and when, you know, they were just awesome. So I can't say enough about that organization. Look, if you have a job in Ontario, if you have a, jo <laughs> if you have a job in Ontario, you shouldn't be struggling uh, to meet your basic needs, especially if you're working uh, full time. And that's why uh, the Ontario Liberal Party is going to increase the minimum wage by, uh, to $16 an hour. Uh, and we're going to develop a regional living wage that factors into um, consideration the different rates of, of living in different regions in the province. So in my view, you can't be for the people if you're not support, supportive of paying them a livable wage. Thank you, Selwyn. We have about 17 minutes left in the program this evening. Sorry? Are we permitted to do rebuttals? Yes. yes. 60 Thank second you. rebuttals, Susan. I just want to quickly point out um, to Mr. Hicks. Mr. Hicks, during the pandemic, there was an increase, a dramatic increase in those who were financially experiencing hardship. But I want to point out that a large portion of those were people who were fired 
because of the progressive conservative mandates and they chose to protect their own body autonomy instead of maintaining employment. That's where a lot of those came from. Thank you, Suzanne. And should we move on to closing statements at this point? Yes, okay. So we're just going to move on with the program just because uh, TV is good until 9 o'clock and we promised everyone we'd get you home by 9, including our candidates here tonight. Uh, I do want to say before we move on to the closing statements. Uh, first of all, thank you to everybody in the audience tonight that came out, that uh, listened, that heard information from all of the candidates that were respectful, and also a special thanks to those that submitted questions. Really appreciate everyone being here tonight. This is very important that we're here and you guys showed up, so thank you. To these people on the stage, uh, thank you so much for being here tonight, for answering all of these questions, for going through this process, for making sure that we are going to have a fine representative moving forward here in Grey Bruce. We appreciate every one of you for your time tonight. We are going to move on to closing statements. We will stay in the order that we were going through with all the uh, questions and everything, which means that uh, Danielle Valiquette of the Green Party will have two minutes to make her closing statement. Thank you so much, and thank you uh, so much to the Owen Sound uh, Chamber for organizing tonight. Thank you so much to uh, JC for moderating this evening, as well as for all of you for coming out on uh, what was a beautiful Thursday. So the Green Party of Ontario wants homes and not highways. We would freeze urban boundaries to build 1.5 million homes and provide people with more choices, such as triplexes, fourplexes, and walk-up apartments. We would clamp down on speculation because homes are for people, not speculators. We would invest $1 billion per year to build 182,000 deeply affordable community rental homes, including 60,000 supportive homes over the next decade. Additionally, the Green Party of Ontario believes that mental health is health, that we need to increase mental health services so that they are covered under OHIP, and that in particular our youth are not waiting sometimes as long as 24 months to see care. We would decriminalize drug use to improve lives, lower costs, and treat mental health. Because this is a public health issue, not a justice issue. And lastly, we support the new climate economy. Not because it's going to save us all, because, but because that is where the future of the economy is. And that's where, moving forward, many of the local jobs are going to come from. The Green Party of Ontario would establish a transparent annual carbon budget to reach net zero by 2045. We would electrify transportation, buildings, and industry to crush pollution and lower energy costs. And we would provide up to $15,000 in incentives for green uh, energy retrofits. Again, I would like to thank you all for coming tonight. And please, on June 2, vote green. Vote Danielle Valiquette. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, next will be uh, Suzanne Coles of the Ontario Party. Thank you, and I also would like to thank the Chamber for hosting this evening and for all of the guests visiting today. I thank you very much for your participation today. We've heard from all of the mainstream political parties this evening, and what we're hearing are promises, promises, promises. When we look at the issue of inflation, the Ontario debt right now is $439.8 billion, in no small part thanks to the Kathleen Wynne Liberal government and the current Progressive Conservatives. Doug Ford is currently proposing to add another $198 billion in spending over the next five years. How many of you were asked if that's what you want? None. We've had broken promise after broken promise. How many of you were asked if that was okay? Probably none. 
The Ontario, Gov Ontario Party is committed to transparency, and it is my personal and significant feeling that we are, as elected officials, civil servants. Servants being the optimal word. We're not here to tell our constituents what they will do and how they will function. But that's how the traditional governments continue to act. They make the decisions without consulting their constituents and then they tell you what you can and cannot do. I will make sure that at all times I have available to the public all bills before the legislature that will inform you of what the bills are, what they mean, and how it will impact you. I will advise a synopsis to explain my position on the, the bills and how I think that they will impact you. And then I will make a statement for you to be able to have input and tell me how you wish for me to vote on those bills. I will at all times be transparent and seek your input in all government decisions. I will not be here to tell you what to do. I'll be here to be your advocate and your voice. At the election, vote for Suzanne, the Ontario Party. At the polls, vote for polls. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, next for the closing statement will be Rick Byers, the Ontario PC Party. Thank you, and like the others, I also want to thank you all for being here this evening. Thank you to the Chamber for organizing the running the event. Thank you to my fellow candidates for your participation and your, and your great comments. And thank you to the audience for your questions. It's been a good discussion. I consider it a real privilege to have the opportunity to put my name forward for your consideration. It's also a privilege to knock on doors and listen to your questions and concerns about what needs to be done to move forward. As your MPP, as I said earlier, I have two of these and one of those, and I'm going to use them in that ratio. I believe that government is about getting things done. Yes, there's debate as we've done tonight. Yes, there's study and process and discussion. All of these are part of the process of developing good policy. At the end of the day, though, it's the outcomes that matter. As I noted in my introduction, my motivation for running is to continue on the record of Bill Walker and the PC government to get it done for our community. And I want to recognize Bill, who's in the very back row there, and for his great service to Bruce Gray Owen Sound for almost 11 years. Thank you, Bill, for all you've done. So whether it's long-term care, health care, infrastructure, schools, daycare, broadband, or other areas, I pledge to work hard, serve our great community of Gray Bruce. Thank you again. My name is Rick Byers, and I would be grateful for your support on June 2nd. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, next to answer will be Joseph Westover, Populist Party of Ontario. Um, as far as our party, I guess we haven't got into too much about it, but uh, we're not really... I'll start with uh, World Biosphere. Titles like that will be eliminated. We'll be back to Ontario dictating what's what in Ontario, not anything to do with uh, foreign uh, governments uh, telling, them, telling us what we can and can't do in our own land. That'll be one thing. We'll uh, be restoring um, laws and binding them to the Bill of Rights and the Charter. Um, anything that's uh, found wanting will be repealed. Um, as far as education is concerned, we're going to get rid of sex education altogether and we'll be uh, reinstituting uh, the teaching of the Constitution and law to our children and what Canada was founded on with the freedoms and who fought for it and died for it so that we can always remember and have a nation that will stand for itself. Um, we'll have less government. Um, whatever's not needed will be cut and uh, save all that money and it can go to other things. Um, we'll have to deal with inflation uh, big time because that's what we're dealing with right now and our debt. There is a way through the, the Bank of Canada that we can actually um, pay off our national debt to the foreigners and we can lend to ourselves through the Bank of Canada at a lower interest rate and we can have our national debt paid off quite quickly. And our governments do know about it and aren't using it. So we would promote that with our federal government as well. Um, 
no more censorship, not online, and certainly not uh, with uh, your free speech. Uh, we'd have our candidates actually represent our community, so I'd be here to serve you. Um, there'd be no more lockdowns, forced vaccinations, or mask mandates. Not at all. They violate the Constitution. Um, we'd we'd uh, attack the carbon tax being in Ontario and try and remove it. Um, and uh, from what I can see... And like that is time, okay. Joseph. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, next closing statement is from Selwyn Hicks, Liberal Party. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you once again uh, to the Chamber for putting together uh, tonight's uh, event. It used to be that if you worked hard and played by the rules, Ontario would have your back. But supports haven't kept up with the times. Folders now have a choice. We can keep rewarding the richest 0.2% or we can ask them to fight against poverty and make sure that no one gets left behind. Ontario can be a place to grow, but only if we make the right choices. We need to build or rebuild what's always made Ontario strong. Education, health care, public services that support working families. They're all key to a better future and economic dignity for our families. It's your choice, ultimately. We can build a province that works as hard and cares as much as you do. In Bruce Gray Owen Sound, you have a clear choice. You have a choice between very nice, perhaps well-intentioned candidates, or experience in an MPP Hicks. And I don't say that to be pompous. I say that because with the exception of my green colleague here, who's a very nice person, by the way, I am. <laughs> I'm the only candidate with experience in a political arena getting results that make a difference. As warden, you saw me pulling together people to address tough issues like affordable housing, rural high-speed uh, internet, and mental health and addictions. I'm not running on a platform that simply says, you know, elect me, I'll do this or that. I'm running on a platform that says, elect someone with a proven track record for getting things done. I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing for the people of Bruce Gray Owen Sound since 2006. Thank you. Thank you, Selwyn. And finally, closing statement from Karen Gaventer of the NDP. I also would like to thank the Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for moderating and thank you everyone for attending. We've heard a number of issues tonight. Uh, a lot have had to do with affordability, affordable housing, inflation. We've heard about the concerns about uh, our health care system. We want to make sure that our health care system stays public, that we don't end up with an American-style health care system where people might lose their houses just because they got cancer and are trying to survive. We need to make sure that PSWs are paid a living wage, and we need to repeal Bill 124 to make sure health care workers are paid a decent amount of money. We do take the climate emergency seriously in the NDP. Throughout our platform, we have addressed the climate change. As I said in my opening statement, it's not just in our climate change section. It's addressed throughout all of our decisions. I would like to challenge Danielle that they are not the only party with a comprehensive, serious plan to combat the climate emergency. Rick said, it's outcomes that matter. I want you to ask yourself, are the concerns that have been raised tonight your concerns? If they are, are the outcomes that we've had for the past four years, are they the ones that we want? I think. If they were the ones that we want, then they wouldn't have been concerns tonight. Which party has been working for affordability for years? The NDP. Which party has been fighting for our public health care for years? The NDP. We also have been fighting the climate emergency for years. We have shown that we are on your side through our policies and, more importantly, through our actions. So on June 2nd, please vote for me, Karen Gaventer. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you, Karen. And keep the applause going for all of our candidates for Gray Brusso and Sound. Thank you to all of them for making the time tonight to be here to answer questions. Uh, again, there will be a few other names on the ballot that you did not get to hear from tonight. Uh, Remy Kaikinen, an independent candidate, Joel Lahey, the Direct Dem Democracy, or Democracy Party, and Vince Romaldi, the New Blue Party of Ontario. Again, if you need information on when and where to vote, when is, if you're voting on Election Day, three weeks from tonight, don't forget it, bring your friends. Uh, otherwise, advanced poll information, all everything you need to know is on the Ontario election website at elections.on.ca. Uh,